Hi everybody, uh, my name is Winston Chang. I'm a uh, software engineer at our studio and today I'm going to be talking about doing interactive graphics with Shiny. Um, there are, are a bunch of uh, code examples which you can see at this URL at the bottom on GitHub <clears throat> and, the, uh, and the slides are available there too. Okay, so here's an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, first I'm going to talk about different kinds of graphics and what we'd use them for. Um, so, so there are static versus interactive graphics. Static graphics are, you know, the traditional um, plots that you would see. Uh, you might print them out. Uh, you can't interact with them. And interactive ones, obviously, are things that you can interact with by, say, using your mouse. Um, there are graphics for different purposes. Um, so, for example, you might have a graphic for presentation, like if you're creating a report that you want to display to somebody or for a publication. Um, and there's data graphics for uh, exploring your data. So if you're still in the uh, data analysis process or you know, in the ex you know, exploratory data analysis phase um, and you, you're trying to learn something about your data, uh, that's, that's another purpose for using a data graphic as opposed to for presentations. So after that, I'm gonna talk about the nuts and bolts of actually creating intergra interactive graphics with Shiny. Um, and so we'll, we'll get into some code. And uh, after that, I'm gonna talk about using, uh, creating Shiny gadgets, which are, uh, those are, it's using Shiny for the data exploration phase. And this is a new feature that we've added in Shiny 0.13, uh, which was released a month ago. Uh, oh, and I should also mention that the, the interactive graphics features were added uh, in the last year. Okay, so if, when we're thinking about data graphics, uh, one question that, uh, well, one issue that's important when thinking about them is, is a graphic static or is it interactive? So here are a bunch of static graphics. These are all generated by R. These should all, these probably all look familiar to you. Um, <clears throat> so one of the most basic things you do in R is to create, uh, to create visualizations like this. So up here we have a histogram created by the hist function. Uh, here we have a scatter plot created by the plot function with a, a well, this one actually also has a, a linear regression, a line added as well. And then over here we have a box plot. And um, these, these graphics in R, this, these are all part of the base R package. And they're all here I mean, they're all they're all static. It's it's sort of the way that things evolved. You know, before um, before R existed, these types of graphics existed, and they were targeted towards probably mostly towards print publication uh, or printing out. You know, creating printouts for reports. And uh, you know, back a long time ago, people drew these out by hand, and then after once computers came around and were able to generate some of these, they were um, they could generate these figures, but they were still meant for printing on paper, and they tended to not have a lot of interactive features. So that's, that's sort of the, the heritage of, uh, of these types of plots. Um, <clears throat> so more recently, this is not like really recent history, but uh, more recently there are, have been interactive graphical systems like this. This is a screenshot. This is actually two screenshots of, uh, of a program called GGOBI, um, which allows one to interact with the data and explore it. So all of these, these plots are linked in this example. This is not a live example, this is a screenshot. Um, but it lets you take a look at the subset of this data. So like, like this yellow highlighted region, um, the data here corresponds to the highlighted bits here and in these scatter plots and in these bars here. And, uh, and then in the, the second plot on the right or the second set of plots on the right, there's a, a larger region that's selected here and the other corresponding points are highlighted. So this sort of tool was used for, or is designed for uh, data exploration when I mean, you're still trying to learn something about your data, but it's not targeted toward presentation for, you know, for obviously, you know, you can't use this for print output because uh, you're not going to be able to interact with a printed page. And, um, and, but even on, you know, even sharing this over a computer is difficult because uh, other people might not have the software, um, and the, the software to, to run the same sort of vi visualization that you've created here. Okay, so 
The second question, which I've hinted at already, is what is the purpose of the graphic? So for a data graphic, um, you might use them for in the exploratory phase of your data analysis. So here's an example. I'm looking at this histogram of the uh, of this built-in data set in R. Uh, it's about uh, geyser eruptions, Old Faithful. So I, I run histogram here. Um, it looks like this. And I decide, well, what if I want to look at uh, the histogram in a little bit more detail with smaller bin size? Well, I can just tweak a parameter. And, and then it looks like this. Um, so I run hist again. Uh, with a greater number of breaks or a greater number of bins, in other words, and um, <clears throat> and then it looked like this. And you know, by tweaking these parameters during the data exploration phase, you might be able to learn something new about the data. Um, but these, you know, it's not these are not all meant to be shared with other people. Uh, this might just this is just for me to learn something about the data. Okay, and then uh, once you're done doing your data exploration and learning uh, about your data and processing it, you might generate data graphics for a presentation. So this is just a page out of a book. It's got these line graphs. Um, and these are meant for, you know, this isn't meant for the, the data analyst or the researcher to learn about the data. This is meant to communicate some findings um, to readers, in this case, readers of a book. Oh, it could be, you know, a print, uh, a print article or just, you know, a report, printed report. Um, or something that's on a web page, dashboard perhaps. <clears throat> okay, so the state of data graphics about five years ago um, was that, uh, well, you could generate, there's tools for generating static graphics for the data exploration phase, and this is a, a screenshot of um, that we saw before, uh, but there's plenty of other tools. I mean, even you know Excel could generate static graphics uh, uh, that you can use for data exploration. Uh, those same graphics, once you finish your data analysis, they could be used for presentation. Maybe you tweak them to look a little bit nicer, but uh, they're essentially the same thing. Um, and for, uh, for the data exploration phase, there were interactive tools like GGOBI, um, which you know, are good for learning something about your data, but it's more difficult to use them to, uh, for presentation to communicate those findings to other people <clears throat> for, uh, for mostly for technical reasons. Uh, but this left this, that, so there's this quadrant, other quadrant here that was sort of left unfilled. So interactive graphics for presentation. <clears throat> well, um, in, in the last few years, that's changed quite a bit. So here are some examples from uh, the New York Times. Uh, these are uh, examples of data journalism. They do a really good job with these. Um, so here's, just, these are just two screenshots. I'll show you these live. Uh, get the web browser up here. Oops. Okay, so uh, here's an interactive tax, uh, tax, well, <clears throat> explorer, like are you receiving a marriage penalty or bonus? So the idea is that, um, in the United States, if you file your taxes uh, as a married couple jointly um, versus filing separately as two um, single people, you may end up paying more in taxes uh, or less, if you're, uh, even if you have the same amount of income. So um, for example, you know, so I just picked this number up here. Um, if you're, you're part of a couple and you earn $81,000 here, um, and all of that is earned by one partner and the other partner uh, doesn't have any income, then, uh, then if you file as a married couple, then you save, you pay $5,300 less in taxes. Um, so whereas if you're up here where, you know, both partners earn about the same amount and uh, then, if, then if you file as a married couple, then you actually pay more in taxes than you would if you filed single. So, um, so this this graphic has some basic interactive features. You know, you can you can hover over it and it'll tell you some information. So if you want to find out, like, you know, I'm a we're a couple, and you know, one person makes this much money, and the other person makes this other amount of money, you can get uh, some detailed information about how much of a bonus or penalty you're paying in taxes. 
Uh, and that's something that, you know, that it adds a lot to this graphic. If you just, if you just see this graphic like this, you know, a lot of that information is there, but it's a little bit harder to interpret and it's, 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 um, it's harder to find yourself on here, like with these, these various incomes, uh, like on this, on the X axis here, it's a total income and the Y axis is the percentage split that's, um, uh, or by, earned by each partner. <clears throat> okay, so that's one example. Um, another example is this uh, this interactive map here. This is about um, well, best and worst places to grow up. So if you are that idea behind this one is if you um, depending on where you grow up and your income percentile, there are some places where it's uh, where if you grow up as an adult you'll tend to earn more money or you'll tend to earn less money based on where you grow up compared to other places in the nation. So I live in, uh, uh, in Minnesota in Minneapolis. So I'll just zoom in on that. As you can see, well, actually, let me back up for a sec. So when you see this large map here, um, there's all this information here. So um, there are some parts of the nation where um, people tend to earn more money uh, when they grow up and some people were the places where they tend to earn less. So I, I live up here, upper Midwest. So I guess uh, people tend to earn more money as they grow up, uh, when they grow up here. Um, but it's, again, it's a little bit hard to interpret that information just by looking at this map. So um, the interactive features that this supports is zooming. And then when I zoom in enough, I can see some value. I can see some numbers here. So there's a $700 bonus if you grow up in uh, Hennepin County, where I live, and are in the 25th, 25th income percentile. And when I hover over it, each one, it, it gives me a little bit more um, sort of a, a detailed text box that gives information, that some, the same information. Okay, but this lets you, you know, this lets this interactive map really lets people learn a lot more about the data than they would otherwise be able to just by looking at just by looking at this zoomed out map. Okay, so that's again, that's something that's pretty new that um, that. Uh, uh, people are able to do now, which is creating these these interactive graphics for pre for a presentation. I mean, journalism, um, these data data journalism examples are good examples of presentation. Okay, so here we've we've filled in the uh, all these boxes here. Now we've got um, so for interactive graphics that are used for presentation, um, there are the technologies to do that today. So uh, the things that have changed that may have made that possible are, uh, um, well, there's, there's two really big changes. So one of them is that there's fast networks for sharing visualizations, right? These are not, these are not things that you can share and print. Um, you can't, we can't publish these interactive graphics to a book and expect them to be, still be interactive. So, and this is, you know, the, tool, the, the technology that has made this possible is the internet. Um, the other change is that there's widespread standardized um, technologies for that people interact with, and these are web browsers. So the web browsers are everywhere. They're on your phone. Um, they're on computers. They're on everybody's desk. And you know, web browsers have also have existed for a while, uh, just like the internet has. But it's only been recently where um, there's been a lot of JavaScript libraries for data visualization that can bring those interactive graphics. Um, to people in, in, uh, in a nice, easy to use way. <clears throat> and that, again, that's, that's something that's really changed a lot in the last, in the last five years. Okay, so we've got the same matrix here, uh, but this time I'm sort of looking at a, a slightly different aspect of it. And what this is showing is what tools can you use to create these things? Um, so up here for static graphics, for both exploration and presentation, uh, you can use R. And with an asterisk here, that asterisk uh, is down at the bottom. I say, look, so uh, I'm, this is R and data visualization packages like ggplot2 and Lattice and, and a host of other ones as well. Um, those are just some of the more popular ones. Um, <clears throat> so R asterisk was capable of creating static graphics for both exploration and presentation. Now for interactive graphics, uh, that was harder to do but uh, previously, but now you can use that same knowledge that you have of R 
and, and add some knowledge of Shiny and create interactive graphics for both exploration and for presentation. So uh, probably most of the examples that you've seen, most of the Shiny examples that you've seen are meant for presentation. Uh, they're meant to be delivered over the web for people to, um, uh, you know, for the data analyst creates this and somebody else is consuming uh, the information. Um, so uh, here's, here's, here's an, uh, a really basic example of, uh, of that. So this is a, um, well, this is probably our most basic example that we have of, of a Shiny application. So this is an interactive graphic where the, the graphic shows a histogram of the same data that we saw before, but there's a slider that can control the number of, uh, of bins that are shown in the histogram or, or the number of bars. Now, this is not a live app, so I'll show you the actual thing by running this code in our studio. Okay. Okay, here we go. So when I move the slider, that histogram updates. Uh, but, um, and this is, you know, from the very beginning, Shiny was able to do this. Uh, it had these sort of web form like inputs. This is a slider, which is a little bit more advanced than a typical web form input, but there's also select inputs and text inputs. People could enter in numbers. Um, and those would influence, those could influence how this uh, a plot is displayed. But, but the, the, this graphic itself is not interactive. So if I click and drag on it, what it's, you can see it's just, it's like I could save this to a file, but I can't actually interact with this plot. <clears throat> okay, now let me go into the code in a little bit of detail here. Um, probably if you've used Shiny before, this should all be very familiar, but if you're new to Shiny, then, um, then you might learn something from this. So there's two parts, there's a UI code and there's a server code. So in the UI, I define um, the layout. So I say it's a basic page. There's a plot output that defines a container for this plot to go in. That's called, and it's called it with the name plot and a slider input um, with the name bins and a bunch of other parameters like the minimum and maximum and uh, a label for it. So that's, that defines it, that, that tells Shiny that there should be a slider input here. Okay, so that's the UI side. That's what uh, shows up in the web. That's what the web browser receives. It's, it's actually just, it is an HTML web page. On the server side, there is uh, this is code that executes in an R process on the server. And I tell it there, there's an output called plot, output dollar plot. And uh, what should be displayed there is this histogram. It's a histogram of uh, this data set faithful dollar waiting. And the breaks, that's the number of bins, is taken from input dollar bins. So that, that's the input here, slider input called bins, and that matches up with input dollar bins. Output dollar plot, that matches up with this plot output plot. Okay, and so that's, that's how it all gets tied together, just but with, on the server side with this input and output, these input and output values. Okay, so, um, all right, so that's, that's like the basic Shiny app. That's the stuff that we've always been able to do in Shiny. Um, now, the new part is these direct interactions with plots. So let me show you an example. Okay. So with that histogram that we saw, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't click or drag on it or anything like that. With this, with this scatter plot here, I can click on it. And as you can see, there's uh, these X and Y values that show up in the bottom there that correspond to where I clicked. So let's say I want to click at five comma, or X value of five and the Y value of 15. That's about right. And um, you can see that's, that's, what, that's what displayed down here. So this is, something, this, is, this is something new, being able to click on a plot like this. Now these raw values might not be so useful on their own, but um, we'll show you what to do with them in a little bit. Okay, let's look at the code. So it's really simple. Um, it's it's uh, it's very simple to use. So with what we have now is a plot output with the plot, <clears throat> and now I say click equals plot underscore click. So it's it's the same as your regular plot output, except you just add this new thing click equals plot underscore click. That defines a new input value called 
plot under short click and it has uh, X and Y positions. So up here I have the render plot and out here this is the, this is the text. Uh, I, I'm generating the text for the X and that displays the X and Y position. All right, and that's just input dollar plot click dollar X and Y. That's all there is to it. But that in and of itself, as I mentioned, might not be super useful um, because you know usually you don't just want the raw coordinate. You know, let's run this again. Um, usually you don't just want the raw coordinate. You want to do something with it, like for example, select the nearest point, right? Um, <clears throat> so in order to do that, there's a function called near points. I'll demonstrate how this. I'll well demonstrate this in action, then I'll talk about the code. So um, now if I click near a point, um, it pulls out, what I'm displaying down here is it pulls out a row of data from the data set and it's actually, because my line wrapping here is a little bit, uh, the line wrap column is a little bit narrow, it's displaying on two rows, but this is, um, this is one row out of the data frame with all these different columns. So I click near this point and it displays that. If I click far away, um, it's not going to, it doesn't display anything. I have to be within five pixels. By, that's, that's the value that I've chosen here. <clears throat> okay, so the code for that um, looks like this. So, uh, so for the, the input or the output dollar info, a render print, and to select a row, I use near points, this new function near points, um, I give it the data object, empty cars, the, the uh, click input, which is input dollar plot click. And then I tell it which columns out of empty cars I'm using for my X and Y axis. So weight or WT and MPG. Um, and and uh, like I said, it, there's a, th well, it has to be within five pixels. That's the value I've chosen. The, the click has to be within five pixels of a point and the maximum number of points it will select is one. That's the maximum number of rows it'll return from the, um, uh, from that data. So, um, and I'll just I'll demonstrate that briefly. So if I'm clicking right here, there's actually a bunch of there's actually two points right here that are very close. But because I've said the maximum number of points is one, it'll only return one row out of the data, which is being displayed down there. If I change that uh, max rows to something else, I could I could have it return more more rows. <clears throat> Okay, now another thing to note is that uh, I, I did that plot with base R graphics. If you're using ggplot2, uh, you don't need to pass in the x variable and the y variable names because those are, uh, Shiny knows enough about ggplot2 objects to be able to extract that information automatically. Okay, now another thing you might want to do with that, so that's, that's one use of, of uh, of, a, of the click information is to select the nearest point. You know, another thing you can do is to add a point to, um, to a plot or to a data set. So, oops, actually, you know what? I should talk about this code first before I demonstrate it. So one thing you might, uh, one way you might do that, you might approach it um, is by using rbind. So, so in this example, I'm just taking empty cars and pulling out the two columns I'm interested in, weight and MPG. And then I say, if, the input dollar plot click is not null. So if there's some, if there was a click, somebody had clicked on something, then R bind a new row to that data frame with the X and Y positions, and then plot that. Okay, so, so this, is, this is a first pass approach at this. And if I were to run this, now this might not come out very well in this, uh, um, in this webinar, but if I click on this, you can see a point appears briefly and then it disappears. So, well, why is that? That's kind of weird. That's not very useful. I'm not actually adding a point to my data. Well, maybe I am, but it only lasts for a moment. Um, well, we can take a look at this code. Uh, the problem is, is that when I click, it sets this input dollar plot click to a non-null value. So uh, it, that tells this whole render plot to re-execute. And then it enters into this if statement and it R binds the data successfully and it plots it. So you, we do see that point for a moment. But then when the plot is up, uh, the, the updated plot is sent to the web browser for display, um, this value for input dollar plot click gets reset. And when that gets reset, 
um, went because the value changed, and that tells the render plot to re-execute. And when it re-executes, this time plot underscore click is null, and um, and it doesn't enter in this if statement. It just plots empty like empty cars without any modification. So 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 we have an issue with reactivity here that we have to deal with. So uh, the way to deal with that is something that uh, I call state accumulation. So it's this combination of using uh, a reactive values object and a, the observe event function. So this is a little bit more advanced, but um, this is if you're if you're doing um, if you're doing interactive graphics where you need to uh, record a bunch of events that happen, like a bunch of changes that people make to it, like clicking on uh, clicking on a plot, you need to you need to save that information somehow and store it and build it up. And so this is this is uh, a common way that you would do it. So it's a combination of uh, reactive values. So here I create something called vals. It's a reactive values object. That is similar to the uh, uh, the input object actually of a of a shiny application. It behaves in a, it, it's the same type of object. <clears throat> um, so and there's an uh, an item in it called MTC. So when MTC changes, you have well vals dollar MTC. Uh, similar to when an input value changes, that will tell any reactives that use that to re-execute. Um, so we don't have to worry about the details right now about how that works, but um, so we have vals, vals dollar MTC, and then we say observe event um, when input dollar plot click changes. That's what this means. Observe event input dollar plot click means when this changes, execute this code. Um, and what this code does is it R binds the existing value of MTC and then adds a new uh, a new row onto that with the x and y positions of the click. And then for the plot, it's very simple. We just we just plot this vals dollar MTC dollar weight and MPG. So if we run this code, um, let's see. Here we go. And now when I click, a new point gets added. So that this may be useful as well for um, experimenting with um, like what would happen if a data point was added here. Um, like how would how would a, a model fit of this change, for example? So, um, yeah. So there you go. <clears throat> All right. Now, uh, this is something that I'll get back to when we talk about gadgets, but it's useful to know right now. So uh, you can have a, a shiny app. Normally, when you deploy a shiny app to a remote server. Um, you don't want the, sh the app to exit and return a value. That, that isn't useful. That would, you would just quit in somebody's web browser. Um, but if you're running it locally, you can actually interact with uh, a shiny app, perhaps with an sh interactive graphic, and then have it return some value. Like, uh, like for example, when I, I was adding those points, you could have it return all the new uh, a data frame containing all the new points. And to do that, you would add an action button called done or call it whatever you want, but uh, just an action button, and then have an observe event, and that's listening on input dollar done, and when somebody clicks on that button, it calls the stop app, and then returns, it returns a value here. So when you run your Shiny app at the, at, the, at the R console, you'd say run app, give it the app, and then save the return value into a variable, and that will that will take when the app stops, it returns vals dollar MTC, and that gets saved into value into this variable called value. <clears throat> okay, but we'll come back to that when we talk about gadgets. So um, some other interactions that was just I showed you clicking. There's some other ones that are useful as well. There's uh, um, well, there's clicking. There's double clicking, and you can see the way that I use the click uh, option before, as I said, click equals the string plot underscore click. Um, that's actually equivalent to running this code. Click equals click opt ID equals plot underscore click. Um, this is just a shorthand, the one that we used. So in this double click, I've written it out in a long way. And uh, the reason that the long form is useful is because you can pass other options to it. So there's also hovering, which is when your mouse moves and rests over a location. Um, you can send that coordinate to the server. So here, in this case, I said hover equals hover opts, and give it the ID, 
And then I set this uh, option delay equals 500. So the, my mouse has to rest some over a plot for half a second, 500 milliseconds, um, before it sends uh, an updated value to the server. Okay, so I'll demonstrate these. Okay, here. Okay. All right. So here is my uh, scatter plot, and oh, you could actually see that. Uh, plot this uh, input dollar plot hover it updates when I move the mouse let me scroll down a little bit so you can see a little bit more of that so right now I'm showing you the entire data structure that's sent from uh, the browser to the uh, to the R process so normally I just access X and Y uh, but those are the top two things but there's all this other information that you can use as well and if, if you need if you want to explore this information you can you can just run str on these uh, on these input values, and and, um, and it'll it'll display this. So again, the hovering uh, updates when I rest my mouse for a moment. Clicking, I just click the mouse, click it again. Um, the value updates when I click. Double click, I double click there. Another double click. Okay, so you can use these values um, for. Well, you can use these different uh, interactions for uh, different purposes. And there's another type of interaction that's really useful, and it's called brushing. So I can select a region. I just click my mouse and dragged it. And this time, instead of just x and y, it's actually giving the x min and x max, you know, this x range, and the y min and y max, and the y range of this. And you, can, you can drag this around, it'll update those values. You can, you can resize it. And as it should be pretty obvious, this, is, this can be useful for if you want to select a bunch of points, um, you know, um, or uh, you, let's say you want to exclude some points because they're outliers. <clears throat> um, you can do it for, use it for that as well. Okay, so now let me show you how the brushing works. It's pretty simple. Uh, like the clicking, it's, it's, you just add a new option, brush equals plot underscore brush. And if you want to see the points or the rows of data or the, or the points that were, that were selected in the brush, you'd say, uh, we have this other function, like near points, it's called brushed points. We say brushed points, give it the data object, empty cars, and then give it the uh, brush input. So input dollar plot brush that corresponds with this here. All right, so that's uh, pretty simple and I'll demonstrate this. There we go, okay. Okay, so here's the plot. Uh, right now, there's zero rows are selected. If I, if I brush over those points, you can see there's uh, three rows are selected. Again, this I got this funny wrapping here. So, there's, but there's three rows that are selected. Um, I can move it over to here, and uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points are selected, and it's just it's printing these out. Um, and you could take these points and do something on them, right? You could um, you could hide them or uh, you could include them in a linear model or exclude, exclude them from a linear model and so on. Um, that brush points function makes it really simple to figure out which points those are that are selected. Okay, so that's, that's, one, uh, that's one use for, uh, for brushing. Um, oh, and there's some other options for the brushing. Uh, if, if you've worked with interactive graphics or if you've designed interactive graphics before, um, you might know the difference between debouncing and throttling. You can control that here. And if you're running, if you know you're running your application locally as opposed to over, the, over you know, serving it up across the internet, then you can reduce the delay before um, that, that the brush has to rest before it sends, the browser sends an update to the server. And you can make it, if you're running it locally, you can make it more responsive by reducing that value. So this is this would update every 30 milliseconds, so that's very fast. <clears throat> okay, so uh, all right, so that's now another technique that you can use um, by taking these uh, plot interactions um, is to link plots. So in the previous stuff I just showed you, here's how to select data points uh, out of a select, out, out of, uh, here, here's how to select data points that were um, clicked on or, or brushed. But uh, we can actually link two plots together. So let me demonstrate an example of that. Okay, so here I have two plots um, and they're connected. Um, 
They're, these are both scatter plots of the same data set, but they're, they're, uh, this one is plotting the uh, HP and disp column, and this one is plotting the MPG and weight column of, out of empty cars. Now, if I select a bunch of points with brush with a brush, um, it'll highlight them in that second plot there. It turns them blue. All right, so this can this can be useful for finding connections between um, the variables in the data. So there seems to be some general trend as we uh, of you know these points are not. When I select a, a group here, it's not just simply a, a random group that's shown in the second plot. There's there's some there's some connection between these variables. <clears throat> okay, so uh, now in this particular example, I don't have the uh, it's it's not possible to brush in the second plot and have it update the first plot. Um, that's that's a bit more code, um, so I'm just trying to keep it simple for right now. So so how does this how do we do this? Well. In the UI side, we create two plot outputs. One of them is called scatter one. One's called scatter two. The first one has we give it a, the brush option or the brush parameter, and uh, we just name it brush. And on the server side, to generate the first plot, we just say render plot and ggplot <clears throat> with some points. So this is, this is the code to create a scatter plot. Um, and for the second one, uh, we do a little bit more. We um, first we find we take the brushed points from MT cars of input dollar brush. You notice that um, this one is using ggplot2, so I didn't have to specify the x and y variables. I just give it the data object and the, the, the brush, so it's very, very easy to call this. And I save that in, uh, in a variable called brushed. And then I do a ggplot of, um, uh, of the data set, and I add a layer of points. This is the base layer. Uh, of points, and then I also add another layer of points given with just the brushed data points. So I say data equals brushed, and then I give it a different color to, to highlight them. So, so that's all it takes to to, to link those plots together that way. Uh, again, th but this is this is one directional linking, or one yeah one directional link brushing. Um, oops. Okay. Um, another. Uh, Another useful technique is linked zooming. So this is, uh, I'll show you an example of this. <clears throat> okay, this is, this is a line graph, well it's actually two line graphs of uh, sunspot data going all the way back to about 1750, from, from about 1750 to probably about 1990 or so. Um, now, this is a this is a time series, and uh, this link brushing is a common commonly used thing in in, uh, in time series. You may have seen this like in stock charts, for example. What I can do is I can uh, they're showing the same data right now, but I can select a region on the bottom here. Uh, so I'm using the brush here in just a horizontal direction, and then it displays that subset of data that's brushed um, up here on top in this first plot. So that lets me look at this with a lot more. Um, a lot more detail, um, and if this, this if this graph wasn't interactive, it would be it would be much more difficult. I mean, you could do this in R, but you'd have to just from the console by plotting it and, and zooming in on, on on regions. But it would be it'd be a lot more tedious work than it takes to just drag the brush over like that. Okay, and if I click outside, then the brush disappears and it resets the first plot. Okay, the way that to do this is um, I've created two plot outputs. Um, and for the second one, I say brush equals brush ops id equals brush, and I give it. I tell it uh, only brush in the x direction. So previously, you were able to brush in the x and y directions by dragging a rectangle. Um, this time, you just drag uh, horizontally, and it, and it selects the whole vertical uh, region automatically. Right? It displays it something in the whole vertical region. Right? So I'm just moving my mouse horizontally, and that whole vertical region is selected. Okay, <clears throat> now the server side, um, for the zoomed in plot, I just say, well, so I've got my ggplot defined up here. Um, for the zoomed in plot, I just say, if the br input dollar brush is not null, then take that plot, which I saved in P, and set the x limits. So that's, that's basically setting the x range for it to the input dollar brush, dollar x min, and x max. And this is with ggplot2, that's the syntax. With base graphics, it's, um, it, it's, it's similar. It's, it's a little bit different, but it's similar. Um, 
So just add that on there with DG plot and then um, and then return the plot. And that's all it takes. Okay, close that. And moving on. Okay, so uh, the next big topic that I want to talk about is uh, shiny gadgets. So the stuff that we've seen, like most shiny apps that you see uh, in the gallery um, are, those are shiny apps that are, they obviously have some interactive features. Um, and whether the graphics themselves are interactive is, you know, sort of a separate question, but uh, th those are often meant for presentation. Um, so for presenting something interesting, like some, something interesting over the web to, for somebody else. Um, now, some of these can be used for data exploration, right? If you're if you are a um, if you're a data analyst, you might create a tool for um, for other people to explore a data set. And so, so the line there's not necessarily a, a sharp line between um, data presentation and data exploration, but um, <clears throat> but there is there's sort of a, a gradual a gradations between that. But now shiny gadgets, these are things that are meant explicitly for the data exploration phase. They're meant for part of when you're doing your data analysis, when you're, when you're learning about it, um, and you want to use some interactive graphical tools for, for exploring your data. That's what shiny gadgets are for. And this is something that was previously not very easy to do in R, but um, hopefully with shiny gadgets, we're making it a lot easier. So they're new in shiny 0 0.13, um, which was released in uh, January. And um, yes, and again, they make it easy to, to use interactive graphics for the, in the exploration phase. Okay, so let me demonstrate a simple one. Now this first one I'm gonna show you is actually not interactive graphics, but it's a, it's a very simple gadget and it's, it's, it's useful to see this before we get into the graphical part to understand what's, what's going on. So this is a, an, uh, a gadget that asks, prompts somebody to type in their password. Now this, this can be useful because uh, in R, well, if you have them type in their password in a, in a function call, it, it could sa be save it in the R history. So I got my, in our studio, you have your history tab here and it can show you everything that you've typed. Um, and you don't want passwords to be in there probably. So if I say, I typed in my password, ABC, clicked done. And as you can see, uh, it returned this value ABC. So I can say, maybe I wanna save that in uh, something called, a variable called PW, I'm gonna type password ABCD done, and then if I type, type PW, it'll print out the value. So, so I've, got, I've got the password saved in that variable. Um, so that's, that's what a shiny gadget is. It, it, runs in the, uh, it, it runs in this little viewer window here. There's, or there's other display modes for it in our studio. Um, if you're not using our studio, it'll pop up in a web browser, uh, but it'll have the same functionality. And, um, yep, and it's, it's a nice, little interactive tool right here that uses Shiny. Um, but this is not meant for deployment, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't deploy this on a website and um, using Shiny server or shinyapps.io. Uh, and you do not want people to click the done button and then have the app exit because, you know, that's, that's not useful. That would, just, that would just kill your app on the server. <clears throat> okay, so there's a, so there's three main differences in how Shiny gadgets operate compared to regular Shiny apps. So the first is that uh, you invoke it from a function. So I call that function get underscore password. Um, and that function, it runs the special Shiny app. Now the special Shiny app has, uh, it uses the mini UI for the layout. It's, that's a new package that we released uh, along with Shiny 0 0.13. And it's meant especially for laying out uh, shiny gadgets or other other applications in this small constrained constrained space, hence the name mini UI. And finally, when uh, the app exits, or sorry, when somebody clicks on the done button, um, it calls stop app and and that, that ends the app and it returns value to the R console. Okay, so let's see. Okay, uh, I'll explain the features here. So first. Uh, as I said, it's invoked from our function, get password. Uh, so I've defined this function here, get password. It's a function that does all this stuff. It defines a UI, server, and then it calls run gadget. 
Okay, uh, that's that's a special function for for doing gadgets. Um, so when they call when the user runs git password, it 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 runs all this code and calls run gadget. Um, and hopefully, you know, uh, if you're making gadgets for other people to use, they just load this. It could be in a package, for example. Um, they they would just have this function, and they all they they don't need to know all the internals of it. They just call it git password. Um, so for the layout, um, this this stuff is from mini UI. So there's this function mini page, uh, gadget title bar, and mini content panel. I'll show how, I'll show you how those line up in a little bit. And uh, <clears throat> finally. Um, we have this observe event input dollar done. So when they click on the done button, it stops the app and returns that input dollar password. Or if they hit the cancel button, uh, then it it stops and says no password. This and this is those are things the gadget title bar automatically has those cancel and done buttons built into it. Okay, so now here's an example of a gadget with interactive graphics. All right, I'll run this application or this gadget. Uh, I think I have it here. Okay. Now the inspiration from the, for this one was uh, I was talking to uh, a friend of mine who's a statistician, and he he was showing me something that he had to do in order to exclude outliers from uh, a data set. So he had a scattered plot like this, and um, the way that he would do it is he, he used R most of the time. So he would save his data out of R. Um, open it up, load it up in Minitab, and then Minitab has a, a little graphical thing for excluding outliers from a data set. So we'd exclude his points, um, save the result out of Minitab, and then import it back into R. And that was just a pain. So he showed me this, and I was like, okay, well, I think we can, we can do something that's a lot better. We can keep it all in R um, and give it a nice interface. So um, scatter plot of that data set. And uh, now if I click on these points, as you can see, I'm excluding them from um, what's being used in this linear model. Uh, and I can, I can brush points, I can turn those ones back on, I can hide these ones, or remove those ones from, from, this, uh, from the model calculation. And I can also change the model, the polynomial degree used in the model. So this is a quadratic one. I'll turn those points back on, or I can use a cubic, um, and so on. So anyway, so uh, let's say I toggle some of these points. Again, I do degree two, and then I say I'm done. Well, okay, let's get that console back so we can see it. See the result here. So I ran it, LM gadget, that's, that was my function, of, uh, that's the name of the function that uh, runs that gadget. I saved that output in a, ver a variable called M. And I just happened, to, I, the way that I wrote this gadget, it returns the data of all the selected data points, all, all the ones that were not excluded. And it also returns the model object. That's an LM object. <clears throat> and you know, it's got the coefficients, uh, polynomial degree two. Um, so it's got the, uh, those two coefficients as well. Okay, so that's, so with this type of gadget, you can, um, you can use R for your analysis, you know, for all the great things that R is great for, for all the uh, stuff that you can run with code at the command line. But you can also use it for those times where you need uh, graphical interaction. Okay. Okay. So now, as I mentioned before, um, I would explain how these things, these uh, functions line up to the UI functions line up to various parts of the interface. So uh, I called mini page that defines this whole page here. Um, I say gadget title bar, and that creates a title bar that goes across the top here. And give it, I give it the name interactive LM, which is printed up there. There's a cancel and a done button that are aud added automatically. And then I add a mini content panel. That's where the, the basic or the main content goes. And then at the bottom, I add a mini button block, which is uh, it's it's a fixed height. Um, thing at the bottom that I can add buttons to. I added two buttons, but you can add more or fewer if you like. And if you've uh, worked with layouts in 
with regular shiny code or, you know, in, in HTML and CSS in general, you know that it's hard to keep a fixed height thing. Um, it can be hard to keep, keep fixed height things at the bottom and um, to have the height uh, of a container scale to the, the, the available size. But min, the mini UI package takes care of that, all of that for you. So that's, that's, uh, that's the reason it's there. <clears throat> Okay, um, this is the code. Well, this is the code uh, that I use to accumulate the state when somebody clicks uh, on a point or uh, toggles them with a the brush. But uh, I think uh, we're running short of time, so I won't go into detail on this. Um, okay, so to wrap up, um, uh, I, well, I talked about uh, static graphics versus interactive graphics. I talked about uh, using graphics for presentation uh, as opposed to exploration. And hopefully you'll be able to take what you know about R and uh, we already know about R and creating plots in R and add this uh, bit of shiny knowledge and you'll be able to create, you know, you'll be able to fill in all four quadrants of that, uh, of that matrix that, that I showed you earlier. Um, there's some other, here's some resources that show you how to do these things. There's the, uh, the article section of the Shiny Dev Center. So it's at this URL and there's two, uh, if you're going on that page, there's two sections that are relevant. There's the interactive plots section and there's the Shiny Gadget section. Um, and in the gallery, there's the, there are interactive plots that are toward the bottom. Um, but there's not a Shiny Gadgets section in the gallery. Uh, these, the gallery actually lets, runs live apps. And so since Shiny Gadgets are not meant to be delivered over the web, they're meant to run in your local R session, there's, um, it wouldn't make sense to put them in, in, uh, in the gallery. Okay, and that just, about, uh, that just about wraps it up. So I can take some questions. Winston, you thank go. you for that wonderful presentation. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yep, I can hear you, Garrett. Great. So there were a ton of questions while you were presenting, and uh, we could sort of narrow them down into uh, just a couple overall meta questions. Uh, so the first of those is, are these examples that you're showing self-contained, or do they involve some sort of server-side processing? Well, they, they do require, the, these examples all involve server-side processing in the sense that there needs to be an R process running. So, um, so they don't just run in the web browser. Um, and uh, if you need to, well, if you need to do that, then there's other graphical libraries that are available um, that uh, that can do it. But they're not; they don't give you the full power of like you can't take, you know, these interactions and run them uh, through your R code, um, and so you don't have as much flexibility. You're limited to what typically what these JavaScript libraries will allow you to do. And then, sort of a similar question, I guess. Uh, can you embed these these interactive graphics and the shiny apps into R Markdown documents? Uh, you can in if you use. Um, I think we're, we've we've turned them interactive docs, so um, you can use them in interactive R Markdown documents. Uh, they won't work in. Uh, so so interactive documents are actually they're actually R Markdown documents that are run as shiny apps, um, but the, your usual R Markdown documents that are just generate a static. HTML web page, those, um, those do not support this type of interactive graphics. Um, but again, they do, they would support uh, interactive graphics that are, that run completely in the client in the web browser. And uh, there are various, uh, well, for those of, that are more advanced users, there are, there are some HTML widgets, packages that use HTML widgets that, uh, that allow this. And then another common question is, what visualization packages does Shiny work with to make interactive graphics? Oh, okay. Well, so I showed uh, for this for this type of interactive graphics um, that I showed. So my purpose here was to talk about things that where you could use your existing knowledge of R and R's graphing packages, um, and then add some interactivity to them. So this is using Base R and uh, and ggplot2. There's other graphing packages like Lattice. Um, unfortunately, we don't support interactions with Lattice at this point. Um, and so for, I think for, uh, for static graphics that you could add, add interactivity to, those are, those are the big ones. 
Um, there are packages that will generate graphics that are meant to be displayed in the web browser. That might be based on, for example, D3. Um, but um, uh, I, 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 at this point, I couldn't tell you a whole lot about those, uh, about which ones uh, work well with Shiny. And then my last question, or the last question is, is this technology meant to replace GGViz, or will GGViz one day replace this technology? That's a, that is, that's a really good question. So um, this, is, this is not meant to replace GGViz. Um, GGViz is it's a work that's, well, we, we've still got some work to do on it, and it's, um, it will support much more. And well, it actually already does support much more sophisticated uh, interactions than what I've shown you here. Um, but there's still some more work. To, well, there's a fair bit more work to be done on it um, to really to get it to do what we want to do. And this stuff is, again, meant to take your existing knowledge of our graphing packages and and add some interactivity to them. So, so in the long term, hopefully, GGViz will um, will supplant this uh, this stuff. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to answer those questions. Right. Yeah. And thanks. Thank you for the uh, presentation. It's been fun. As well.